Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Jim Van Orman, who is Professor of Geochemistry and Mineral Physics and Chair of the Department of Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. His research group focuses on planetary interiors, including our own, using a combination of experiments and modeling. And tonight, he will tell us about simulating planetary interiors in the laboratory. Please welcome Professor Van Orman. When I say simulating the interiors of planets, I'm not really going to be talking about simulating the actual processes that, that happen primarily. But instead, um, I'll, I'll talk about how we simulate the pressures and temperatures, the conditions inside of planets, and measure the material properties, and then what that tells us about how we combine that with other information to figure out what's going on inside of planets. So this is a, uh, a simulation based on actual data of 750 million years of plate motion on the Earth. And uh, to the extent that you think about plate tectonics, you probably think about it in terms like these. What's going on on the surface? And that's a really important thing. The continents have moved around a lot over time. That's had big impacts on, for example, the evolution of life, at least uh, animal life that's living uh, on the continents. But it's important to keep in mind that plate tectonics isn't just a surface thing. It's actually uh, intimately connected to what's going on in the interior of the planet, which is what actually allows it to happen. Uh, people knew about uh, continental drift or had ideas about it for a long time, but never had a mechanism for how that worked until plate tectonics and that revolution in the, in the 1960s and 1970s. And the way that it works and what allows it to happen is that the interior of the Earth, the mantle, we know that it's a, a solid material. It's made out of rock, much like the, the rocks that, that uh, you see on the surface. But on geological timescales, it behaves like a really viscous fluid. It can flow. Um, and so what actually uh, drives plate tectonics is the plates at the surface cool off at the surface. They're much cooler than the interior of the planet, which is kept hot by mainly radioactive uh, decay and heat production due to that. Cools off at the surface, condenses the materials uh, become denser, and ultimately, as they, as they move away from uh, the ridges where new plates are, are formed, they sink down into the end of the mantle. That's what drives the whole process. It's the way the planet loses heat. And um, what's interesting is that of all the planets in the solar system, all the planets that we know about, Earth is the only one that has plate tectonics. Um, if we look at Venus, for example, we look at Mars, Venus is almost exactly the same size as the Earth. It's made of the same stuff. Um, it's just a little closer to the sun. And that difference, something about that difference means the difference between having plate tectonics and not having plate tectonics. We don't know exactly why that is. There are uh, several different ideas and, and probably several different contributing factors. One is that the surface of Venus is hotter than the Earth's surface. And one of the things that, uh, that plate tectonics needs to operate is you have to have plate boundaries that are, that are weak, that uh, are, are faulted and fractured. And maybe the surface of Venus is hot enough that those fractures heal up faster than they can you know, keep going and that once a deformation zone forms, it can heal up again. Another uh, aspect that's probably important is that uh, Venus doesn't have any oceans. It's too hot. Oceans have boiled off. They've been lost uh, at the top of the atmosphere. And so as volcanism happened on Venus, there's water continuously coming out of the interior, and it gets lost to space. And the Earth, a lot of that water gets recycled back into the mantle. And what happens is the little bits of water that go into the mantle actually have a big effect. They weaken it. Uh, they make it much easier to flow. 
Venus doesn't have that, so it probably has a much stiffer mantle. So those are some of the things, the subtle differences that can make a big difference. And um, that recycling, like the recycling of water, is actually really important for uh, the Earth over time and for what's happening at the Earth's surface because it helps to keep Earth habitable for a long period of time. So carbon dioxide, for example, along with water, is continuously on geological timescales recycled back into the Earth so that unlike in Venus, where all the carbon dioxide has gone into the atmosphere, you have a runaway greenhouse effect making it completely un uninhabitable. Uh, the Earth has maintained a, a moderate climate with some variations for a very long uh, period of time. So um, how, how do we learn about uh, the interior of the Earth? The deepest drill hole uh, that, that we have, which is in um, uh, northwestern Russia, the Kola Peninsula, uh, reaches only 12 kilometers down into the Earth. So it's just barely, the continental crust is about 40 kilometers thick. So we're not even through the outermost skin uh, of the Earth in terms of direct observation. So what we have to rely on is uh, for actual observational information is, is remote sensing of various kinds. And for the Earth, we can't apply this, unfortunately, to other planets except a little bit for the moon uh, after the Apollo programs, is remote sensing by earthquakes. And every time there's a large enough earthquake, there are what are essentially sound waves that uh, travel uh, through the Earth and be, can be recorded anywhere that you have a seismometer that can measure uh, the ground motions due to those waves traveling through. And, um, we now have a lot of data from seismology. One of the very uh, first things that we learned more than, more than 100 years ago is that uh, there's a core. We already sort of knew that based on the density of the bulk density of the Earth, but we could then measure how large the core was and tell other things about it based on uh, this sort of diagram. So these uh, seismic waves as they travel through follow curved paths because there are changes in the seismic velocities as they travel through. And so they take these curved paths, but when they hit the core, they slow down and they are bent in the other direction. And this leads to shadow zones where you don't pick up any earthquakes. So when there's a big earthquake, you, you will record that earthquake at different times all around the globe, except in these shadow zones. And that tells you that there's a core there and how you can use that to figure out how big it is. There are also a different kind of waves that are not as much like sound waves where the material motion is perpendicular to the direction they travel. And those don't travel through liquids at all. The outer core is liquid. They don't go through. So you have a really big shadow zone there that also gives information. Well, we now have a lot uh, more seismometers around and we can do something that's kind of like medical ultrasound imaging of the Earth. Um, we don't have nearly as high resolution images as we have from ultrasound imaging because we've got to wait for you know, big earthquakes to happen. They've got to happen at the right time. You have to have seismometers lined up in the right place. But uh, here's an example where a dense array of seismometers was set up to record earthquakes where people knew earthquakes would happen at the Tonga Trench. This is where a subducting slab is going down and it generates a lot of earthquakes. And based on that, this is a picture, a cross section through the Earth of the seismic wave speeds. The blue colors are faster seismic wave speeds and those are generally interpreted as colder material there, colder materials. So have stiffer bonds and the seismic waves travel through faster and red for hotter regions where the uh, velocities are, are slower. And what you see there is actually the subducted slab uh, that's going down into the mantle at that subduction zone. And it's colder because it's cooled off at the Earth's surface and it remains cold. You might have an image of your head of, of a slab melting away it doesn't happen. They stay cold for a very long time. They do lead to melting, but that's because water is coming off of the slab and, and leading to melting um, above it. So in addition to things like seismology, and there's some other geophysical uh, techniques we can use, we have sampling by volcanoes all around the, the Earth, which are coming from the deep interior, 50 to 100 kilometers deep. Still not that deep, uh, but they have good coverage over the Earth. And occasionally, those volcanoes 
have incorporated in them the lavas that come up have little chunks of the Earth's mantle inside. So even though we can't go there and pick these up, there are pieces, those green pieces there um, are chunks of the Earth's mantle. They're mainly, the green mineral is olivine, which is the main mineral of Earth's upper mantle. And there's a, we had a rock, and maybe we can pass it around in, in questioning, that's very much like this one that has those, those uh, chunks of, of mantle in it. So the way we uh, build up a, a picture of what's going on inside of a planet, we basically have three classes of, of sort of uh, investigation here. We have observations, and there are many, many different types of observations. Seismology, we have samples, all kinds of other information. For seismology, we only have that for the Earth. We don't have as many observations for the other planets. Um, and then we've got uh, material properties that we can investigate. We know basically what the Earth is made of based on the observations that we have from seismology, from samples, and so on. Now we can investigate their properties and figure out uh, and in incorporate those into geodynamic models. And here's an example of that here for mantle convection, how flow happens, and then relate that back to the observations uh, that we made. So it's a lot like uh, weather modeling and weather forecasting. In that case, there are a lot more observations that we have, really dense observations. There are really uh, powerful computer models for figuring out what's going on. The material properties in that case are well known and have been for a long time. So that's not really an active area of investigation, but for figuring out what's going on in planets, this is a critical part and very actively investigated because we don't really know the critical properties that determine how they behave very well. Well, I'll give you, you know, sort of one example of uh, uh, sort of the process that, that we go through to figure things out in the mantle. These are uh, average velocities of the P waves, which are kind of like sound waves, and the S waves uh, that travel through every time there, there, there's an earthquake. These are the average velocities with, with depth in the Earth's mantle. So what you see is, in general, there's an increase of, of velocity as you go down. The pressure is getting higher. The bonds are getting stiffer. Uh, the waves travel through more quickly. But you can see there are a couple of places where there, there are jumps in the velocity. And we knew about these jumps before we knew what caused them. Uh, there was a lot of debate about that. Maybe there are different compositions, different types of rocks at different layers. That's basically what causes uh, a difference between the crust and the mantle. They have different compositions. But it turns out it's not that at all. The, the whole mantle has about the same composition everywhere, but there are transitions in the structure of the materials that make them up. So that olivine, the green mineral that, uh, that uh, I showed you in that uh, previous slide, that transforms to a completely different structure that has different properties. At one of these, the pressure that corresponds to this depth, there's another transition here to a different structure. And so once people, once it was established, you know, 20 years ago, it was pretty clear that this was what was happening. Everybody accepted it. And now everybody wants to measure the properties of those materials to figure out more about what's going on. And one of the interesting things about those minerals, both of them, is that they can incorporate a lot of water into their structures. So this isn't water like water filling up pores. This is bound up in the, in the chemical structure, basically hydrogen, oxygen uh, atoms dissolved into the mineral, but it can hold a lot, like 1% 1, 1 or so, uh, the, these minerals. So that led to the idea that maybe there's actually a lot of water sitting at those depths in the transition zone. Olivine can't hold any water, the deeper minerals can't, but these, these can. And very recently, um, there are some diamonds, uh, most of them come from Brazil, that come from ve very deep in the Earth's mantle. And they have inclusions that, that are included in, inside as the diamond grows uh, of these deep uh, mantle materials. So this is a diamond, uh, one of those very deep diamonds that has an inclusion that you can't see of ringwoodite in it, one of these very high pressure minerals that comes from depths greater than 520 kilometers in the Earth. And it turns out that it has a lot of water inside. So not only can these absorb a lot of water, they seem to at least sometimes have it. And so the picture now is that uh, we may have something like this where 
there's water that gets incorporated into minerals in the subduction zone at the ocean floor. There's reactions between the, uh, the rock on the ocean floor and, the, and water to make hydrated minerals. Those are subducted down into the mantle, bringing some of that water with them. Some of it comes off and causes uh, melting and volcanoes, but other, uh, some of that water goes down and can be incorporated in the, in the transition zone. And that, uh, we could have one to two oceans worth of water there. So that's pretty important. We didn't know about that until, you know, starting 10, 20 years ago and didn't have any evidence for it until a couple of years ago. But if those minerals didn't exist, you couldn't have that water there, it'd be on the surface and we'd have a lot less uh, land area. Any questions that you have? Your last slide, you showed like some worm-like water lenses in the, between the mantle and the transition zone there. Yeah, is that like a hunk of water there? I think that is supposed to represent a little chunk of, uh, of a subducted slab that stalls out in that uh, transition zone. And the reason, part of the reason that may happen that I'll touch on a little later in the talk is that uh, the viscosity, there's a big jump in viscosity as you get into the lower mantle because you have a different transition. And that, in part, uh, can cause these slabs to stall out for a while until they become dense enough to, to drop down again. I'm wondering how abrupt those transitions between minerals are in terms of depth, like how much uh, is there on either side of that like 520 kilometer um, transition? They depend on pressure and temperature. So if you have colder regions or warmer regions, that will, that will cause that transition to, to you know, change in depth by about on the order of 10 to, to 20 kilometers. The other thing is they're not, so that's where those different minerals are stable, but then you have a kinetic problem. How fast can they transform? And um, it's pretty fast except sometimes in a subducted slab right in the center of it where it remains cold for a long time, that may be a significant factor that can cause one to persist metastably uh, until, until deeper. But you know, something on that order, maybe 10 kilometers or so. But in any one place, it's, it's usually a pretty sharp transition. This uh, water that's below the surface, do we know if it's salt water or fresh water? Well, th this is water. It's not uh, water per se. It's kind of like uh, maybe the best analogy I can think of is a carbonated beverage where you have carbon dioxide dissolved in the water. So when it's dissolved in the water, it doesn't exist as, as a gas bubble, but it could become one. For example, if you, you know, release the pressure on it, it becomes less soluble and you, you make little bubbles of it. It's kind of like that. The water is incorporated in the structure. Um, it's not, you know, salt or fresh. It's not really water. It's, it's OH. But when you heat up the mineral, for example, or it breaks down, it comes off as, as water. And it would have a lot of stuff dissolved in it, not just the normal salts that, uh, that you get, um, you know, in deep aquifers, for example, um, uh, in the Earth's crust. This would have all kinds of silica dissolved in it. You know, it'd be really weird water, but as it got closer and closer to the surface, that would come out. And you can see this as you, as you see, see rocks, you can see quartz veins that, that precipitate out of, uh, and water eventually makes it to the surface. Diamonds in the picture there. Could you just explain um, how you go from carbon to a diamond and why it makes more space that way? Finding those uh, inclusions uh, the only place you're going to find them is included in a diamond. So there are, um, you know, these are found in kimberlites, um, which is a peculiar kind of volcanic eruption that there's no modern analog for. We only see them in the, in the ancient record. Most of them are really old, billions of years old, but some of them are only hundreds of millions of years old. Uh, the closest one to us is in Pennsylvania, and I've, I've tried to find it before, but I, I haven't been able to find those rocks. They don't have diamonds in them, unfortunately. Some have diamonds, some don't. Um, but these are, you know, pop up all over the world, and they're explosive eruptions. These uh, magmas are full of carbon dioxide, and it's kind of like popping the top on like a, an almost frozen carbonated beverage. They 
zoom up to the surface because they're charged with gas and then they freeze really quickly too because that gas expands and it cools off. Um, so they have some diamond in them. They're from carbonated regions of the mantle. There's some carbonate there. Some of that carbon gets reduced and forms diamonds. Most diamonds are really old. Some of them are, are a little bit younger. But as they grow, they incorporate some of the material that's around them. They're not growing just into space. They're growing around lots of stuff, and they can trap minerals inside. And that's just about the only place you can find on Earth these high pressure uh, minerals like ringwoodite because they're protected inside of diamond, which is really hard, stiff material. They decompress as they come up, but they still provide a little bit of pressure and they come up fast enough, cool off fast enough that those minerals don't back transform to olivine, which happens everywhere else. Um, it's really easy to reverse those transitions as you bring the rocks up to the surface. So it's hard to find those high pressure uh, minerals. You only find them in diamond inclusions sometimes or in shocked meteorites where you generate really high pressures uh, transiently and then they cool off very quickly. So the rock I'm holding is from the mantle or? The, the green part of it is. The black part is the lava that it was incorporated in that cooled oh, okay. off. So That's it comes the basalt. up through the volcanoes. And uh, the green part is, is a chunk of peridotite that, that came off the wall. And the, the, la the magma had to rise fast enough that it didn't you know, drop back through what it. What prevents, OK, it seems like it's, a, it's quite a balance, a balancing act. There, what prevents the water from the oceans from just leaking down like a bottom of a broken cup and cooling everything and stopping everything. The only way the water really gets down much of it, most of it comes off, you know, the water that's incorporated in sediments, you know, in pores, gets just scraped off of the slab as it, as it goes down. Um, and then there's, there's water that's trapped in hydrated minerals, amphiboles, serpentines, things like that. Um, those go down, but as they heat up and as they uh, compress, those minerals become unstable. They release their water. That's what actually leads to subduction zone volcanoes. So the classic stratovolcanoes that you see, those are associated with subduction zones. They're due to the release of that water, which lowers the melting temperature and, and causes magmatism. So most of the water basically goes down and comes back up uh, within the first 100, 200 kilometers. But some of it uh, apparently makes it all the way down um, into the transition zone, and there it gets trapped uh, because it has a high solubility. Thank you for joining us. You have been watching Dr. James Van Orman telling us about the Earth's interior and how we measure it. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Van Orman will tell us about the experimental facilities that allow scientists to reproduce the extreme pressures and temperatures of the Earth's interior. Now, back to the talk. This part I'm going to talk more about planetary material properties, how we measure them, um, how we know what they are. And the big problem here is that planetary interiors are under very high pressures and high temperatures. The weight of all the rock on top of them uh, leads to these very high pressures. At the center of the Earth, we have pressures of 364 gigapascals, which I realize means nothing to you. And it's so far outside of regular human experience that even when I tell you that it's 3.64 million atmospheres, that probably still doesn't really mean anything to you. Um, it's so much higher than the pressure, you know, at the bottom of a deep sea trench, which would squish you down to about half your size. This would, you know, just make you into a diamond really, really quickly. <laughs> With, so, with a lot of water just going um, <laughs> So it, it's a big challenge to actually simulate those pressures and temperatures um, in the laboratory with physical uh, experiments. Um, the tools that we have for studying material properties, basically there are two, two different things that we can do. We can use molecular simulations. Um, and basically, we, we know enough about the, uh, the forces that act between different atoms now that we can do these simulations without really referring to experiments anymore. Um, and put together a simulation where you have, this is an example of a basalt type 
lava where we have thousands of atoms all interacting with each other. Um, and basically, uh, once the forces between them are established, you just apply Newton's laws to these, force equals mass times acceleration, and let the whole thing go. And from those simulations, you can get a lot of uh, really important information. You can derive a lot of the properties, the things that you can measure experimentally. It's still important to do experiments to measure those because we don't have perfect accuracy you know, in describing um, the forces between the atoms. Um, but these are really important because it's easy to go to high pressure. It's easy to go to high temperature. We don't have any of the experimental difficulties that we have. And in some cases, this is all we've got. So it's important to test those with experiments. And the other way is to actually, in some way, apply uh, high pressure to a sample, apply a force to it, um, and heat it up, and uh, measure the properties under those conditions. Um, one type of experimental uh, method that's used for uh, investigating material properties um, is dynamic compression, shock wave experiments. And the classic shock wave experiments um, used a, a real projectile. I've, I've seen you know, one 30-year-old lab that actually had a gun. <laughs> and they fire this projectile um, you know, at something else, and it creates a shock wave through the material, heats it up, compresses it you know, to, to very high pressures, and then you can analyze it in various ways. Um, this is a different uh, kind, same basic idea, but instead of using a physical projectile, a sample is hit with an optical laser with optical uh, frequency radiation, and those photons hit and impart their momentum to the sample, and that creates a shock wave going through the material, and on really, really short time scales, you get really high pressures and really high temperatures. Um, so you can get to pressures uh, and temperatures greater than the center of the Earth, you know, up to Jupiter uh, type, type pressures and temperatures. And then there's an X-ray laser, which looks like it has a little marshmallow around it uh, there, but it doesn't really, um, that acts as basically a super high-speed camera. And that tracks what's going on with the structure of the material on time scales of like 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, so there's a lot of information you can get from these on really short time scales. You can find out about the structure of the material, how that changes, how the density changes, when it melts. You can, you can find all of that out. Um, you can't measure everything you want because everything's on a really short time scale and everything follows a particular curve of pressure and temperature. You can't do things cold because when these shock waves go through, they heat up the sample quite a bit. But there's a lot of information, and for really, really high pressures and temperatures, like center of the Earth, this is really the only thing that you can do, is these types of shock wave experiments. The other types of experiments are static high pressure experiments, where you want to apply that pressure for a long period of time and independently control the temperature. And um, there's several different devices that are used for doing this type of experiment, and they all rely on uh, you know, pressure as a force over an area. They all rely on applying a force uh, to a relatively small area. So uh, to get to higher and higher pressures, there's only so much force you can apply up to some point, and so you've got to decrease the area uh, of the sample that you apply that force to. And this uh, is an example that, that someone's holding in their hand there of a diamond uh, anvil cell, which is one of the most important tools for investigating material properties of uh, planetary interiors. Um, it's pretty small, um, but this can go up to really high pressures, up to about 300 gigapascals, pretty close to the, to the pressures at the center of the Earth. And um, just move on to the next one so you can see kind of up close what's happening here. You basically have two diamonds that are gem type diamonds about the size of one that you, you might uh, have on your finger. And um, you have a sample inside that you can't see. There's a little uh, ring that's a gasket that's just preventing the sample from squeezing out when you press the diamonds together. But you basically turn a screw or a set of screws to uh, press those diamond tips against each other. And that can generate really high pressures, just even with your hand, because you're looking at a really tiny area. Um, so then what you can do is you can squeeze these samples up to really high pressures, 
And then diamonds are nice because they're transparent to lots of different uh, to, to radiation. You can shoot a laser through, which, will, uh, which can heat up your sample. You can put an x-ray beam through to look at the structure of that sample and how it changes as you uh, compress and heat the sample. Um, here is uh, an example, and these are experiments done by a uh, postdoc working in my lab, Jeff Piggott, uh, that he did during his, his PhD. Um, this is a little wafer with nickel on one side, SiO2 in the middle, and nickel on the other side. The nickel absorbs laser radiation, so it allows the sample to heat up. 40 microns, that's about the width of a human hair. So it's a tiny little sample, and you can see it there uh, between the, the diamonds. Um, so for some experiments, um, you need larger samples. So for experiments where you're looking at you know, how does a material deform, it doesn't work. Uh, it's very difficult to do those in the diamond anvil cell. Um, so we need larger uh, volumes to work with. And this is the type of, uh, of press that I have in my lab and mostly what I focus on. Um, but most of these presses, so this, this uh, example here, they're called multi-anvil presses, and there are two sets of anvils. There's one larger one, those silver uh, pieces, there are three of them, and there, are, there will be three more that go on top, that compress that, uh, that black uh, cube in the middle. And that cube is actually made up of eight cubes that has an octahedral cavity in the middle of, of that. And in that octahedron is where the sample goes. And exactly what you put in there depends on what you're trying to do. But essentially, you have a little resistance heater that you put current through to heat up your sample. And you have a little thermocouple. Um, I have an example of, of one here that you can look at um, after, the, after the talk um, with the little thermocouple wires coming out. But this is about how big they are. And your sample is about a millimeter uh, inside of that. And so for routine experiments like this, you can get up to about 25 gigapascals, which is close to the top of the Earth's uh, lower mantle, and, um, and, and high temperatures. So those two sets of, of anvils fit inside of that cylinder there, and then they're compressed by a hy hydraulic ram. So that ultimately compresses on all sides of the octahedron and goes to high pressure. So there, uh, for routine experiments, you use tungsten carbide anvils. Those can go to about 25 gigapascals. If you want to go to even higher pressure, you can use centered diamond, the smaller ones. But those are really expensive. They're five, $6,000 a piece. You need eight of them. They break pretty often. Uh, so that can be really expensive when those, those fail. Uh, a lot of experiments with diamond anvil cells and with these uh, large presses are now done on synchrotron beam lines, which are really intense uh, X-ray sources. Uh, this is uh, the advanced photon source at Argonne National Lab close to Chicago. Uh, for scale, there are some parking lots down there that you can see. So this is a big ring, almost, almost about a kilometer around. And there are lots of uh, different beam lines uh, where x-rays come off that are used for doing physics and biology research. And there are a couple of them at the, that focus on high pressure uh, experiments at this synchrotron. Um, here's an example of a large press that's on a synchrotron beam line. This one's in Japan. And that whole press goes on to a stage that moves uh, the whole press around so that the sample is in the x-ray path and that you put it right at the focus. Um, so it moves the whole huge press, it weighs about 20,000 pounds around to, with micron precision. And that allows you to do some pretty cool uh, stuff. So not only can you investigate the structure of the materials with x-rays, but you can um, do x-ray radiography, like medical imaging. And here's an example of an experiment where this is a sample of, of a basaltic melt. So you know, oceanic uh, basalt, and we'll see it happen again, that has some little platinum spheres in it. So there's a big one that you see dropping, and there are two smaller ones that come afterward. So what's happening there is the sample's being heated up. Ultimately, when you see the sphere start to drop, it's melted, and then it starts, starts to drop. The other ones come later because there's a little bit of a temperature gradient and the top part doesn't melt until a little after. And this al actually allows you to measure the viscosity of the material at, um, 
at high pressure and high temperature because the rate that that sphere drops depends on the density difference and how viscous the liquid is. Um, so that's important for understanding early, early evolution of planets. Um, a lot of planets went through a magma, or thought to have gone through a magma ocean stage where you had mostly magma. And we want to know how does the, the stiffness, the viscosity of that material change as, as you go to high pre higher pressures and temperatures. Um, OK, I'll uh, stop there for more questions. This is actually an example of a different type of multi-anvil device that has the same sort of octahedron inside. This one is at uh, ETH in Zurich. Um, and there are similar ones in Japan. But these are, are used mostly for the, uh, for the experiments with the centered diamonds because this whole ball gets dropped into a, a bath of oil and the bath of oil gets compressed. So you get more uniform uh, force on the sample that way so that the cubes are less likely to break. Um, they're a real pain to work with from what I've heard. I've never done an experiment with these, but it takes a day to put one together, a day to clean up all the oil afterward. But when you have, you know, like forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of centered diamonds, it's worth it. <laughs> For the multi-anvil press, um, about how large are the samples used? Uh, the samples, well, this, this is an example of one of the oct octahedra that you use. And you can use samples that are a range of sizes up to about that big, you know, up to like centimeter size. Uh, but those don't go to as high a pressure. Um, so to go to high pressures, um, you use samples about this size. And then uh, you can see this uh, later. I'll, I'll, I'll show anybody who's interested. But there's a little um, hole drilled through the octahedron that the sample goes into. So the actual sample itself is about a millimeter in size that you can heat up to high temperature. When you do the, uh, the x-rays heat up the sample, correct? No, they really, uh, they don't have, you know, compared to, to all of the power that you're putting through the x-rays, you know, we're in a tiny little spot. They really don't heat up uh, the sample. And with the diamonds, diamonds are really, really good thermal conductors, even better than metals. Um, so that heat gets... Kind of sounds like expensive research. You got to have a lot of diamonds around. Yeah, well, if, if you push the yeah, limits, if... Um, they have to be really high quality diamonds. So they can't have inclusions in them or they'll break for the really high pressure experiments. There are some of these diamond anvil cells that, that are used for lower pressure experiments where you just want to be able to see what's going on inside of the sample. Those you can do hundreds of experiments and the diamonds won't break. But if you're pushing the envelope, if you're trying to, you know, uh, do experiments, uh, you know, core pressures, core mantle boundary pressures, if you're trying to metallize hydrogen, which is what you know, people in physics are often trying to do with these. Um, then you, you, if you're pushing the envelopes, you break a lot of diamonds. One, I don't do that kind of experiment, but a, a postdoc that I worked with broke 120 diamonds in uh, two years uh, because he was really trying to push the envelope and go to high, highest pressure he could. Um, so that's, that's a lot of money. They're about $1,000 a piece or, or two. Well, what kind of sensor do you have to, for your x-ray crystallography to actually see the structure that you're looking at? Is it I, the one that you showed where it was time-lapsed? Obviously, you have a, some sort of sensor to do that. So, so there you have a, a CCD camera. So with these, you have a, a diffraction detector looking at diffracted x-rays to look at the structure of the material. So the x-rays are diffracted. It's like a diffraction grating where the atoms, the layers of atoms are the, are the, you know, the grating. Um, and then for the radiography to look at the image, you have a CCD uh, camera in there. So you can you just choose one or the other. And we often toggle between one and the other, depending on the type of experiment uh, that we're doing. Uh, you indicated that the core generates heat from radioactive decay in that hole that was 12 uh, kilometers deep. Were they able to detect increased radiation? Well, there, there's, it gets hotter very fast, and that's one of the problems. So, you know, um, I haven't followed the progress on that, on that hole recently, but 
once they got down to 10 kilometers, further progress down becomes really, really slow and expensive. So getting beyond that 12 kilometers because it's so hot. So it, um, it's not that, it, that there's more, there's actually more radioactive production in the crust uh, per unit volume than there is in the mantle because there are more, more uranium, there's more uranium, thorium, potassium in the crust. Um, but it's closer to the surface, so it can conduct away out, uh, out of the, you know, out of the surface. So the temperature increases pretty quickly through the crust, and then in the mantle, because it's well mixed by convection, it's 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 more uh, it changes less rapidly with depth. So you're not really, you know, depending on the type of rock you're in, you'll have more or less radioactivity. But it's not that it's increasing really with depth, but the temperature does. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. James Van Orman. Dr. Van Orman is chair of Case Western Reserve University's Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Sciences Department. In the second part of our talk, we learned about experiments that recreate the heat and pressure of the Earth's interior. In our final segment, Dr. Van Orman will discuss how our knowledge of material properties at high temperatures and pressures improves our understanding of the Earth's interior. Now, back to our talk. So in this last segment, um, I want to focus more on one important parameter, and it's one of the things that we uh, uh, work on in my group um, that, that has a strong influence on uh, the internal evolution of a planet, and that's the viscosity. So the viscosity of, of the materials really determine how fast things go and changes in the viscosity can affect the style of the flow inside of a planet, which has an impact on the surface like it does for plate tectonics. So this is just to give you sort of an idea of the viscosity of different substances. Viscosity is the resistance to flow. So a low number is uh, something that's uh, more like water, which has a viscosity of 0 0.001 Pascal seconds, molasses 8.7, about the same as a basaltic lava. Um, then you go to peanut butter, which is about 100 times more viscous than basalt. Tar, pitch is another uh, 10,000 times more viscous. And then you get to the Earth's mantle, upper mantle and lower mantle, um, which is, if I've done my numbers right, like a billion trillion times as viscous as uh, um, peanut butter. So it's really, really high viscosity. Um, but on millions of years time scales, it still flows. And the problem is actually trying to measure the viscosity of something that's that viscous. You can't do experiments like the movie that I showed you where you drop a platinum sphere through. You could wait, you know, <laughs> you're the age of the earth and nothing would happen. Um, but um, it's important to do experiments and figure out how to do this um, because we have some constraints on, you know, from observations on what mantle vis Earth's mantle vi viscosity does. Um, not everything we want, but quite a bit. But for other planetary bodies, we don't know that unless we do experiments. We don't have any observational data. And some uh, planetary bodies, some exoplanets, uh, may have very, very different compositions than the Earth. Um, there are thought to be um, water planets that have a lot more water than the Earth does. So they may have, if the temperature is right, water on the surface, but as you go to higher and higher pressure, that water will solidify into some phase of ice, not the ice that we know, it's not cold. Um, if we want to know how the interior of those planets behave, um, we need to experimentally or somehow investigate what their rheological properties are, what their viscosity is. So if we look at the Earth, Earth's mantle, where we have some observational constraints and we also know the materials and we have some experimental constraints, we know that the uh, viscosity is pretty variable. Uh, so this is a geodynamic model, a uh, snapshot of a geodynamic model. You can see the blue subducting slabs going down. And because those are cold, they're much more viscous than the surrounding mantle. Um, 
So they have viscosities up to a thousand times more viscous than the surrounding mantle, which is quite a bit warmer. And it takes them a long time to heat up again. The other thing that happens is there's a transition. There are the transitions that I already talked about, but there's another one uh, to a denser, much stiffer uh, mineral called bridgmanite that happens at about a depth of 660, 670 kilometers and gives you another increase in viscosity. And that, in part, may cause slabs. Sometimes, based on seismic tomography, slabs will um, stall at the top of the mantle, in part because it's more viscous. And sometimes they'll, they'll later plunge down through. So those viscosity differences have a, a big influence on what's going on in the interior that, that feeds back to the surface. Well, we have some observational constraints on what mantle viscosity is. One, we know the rates of plate motion, and that's related to the viscosity. So that gives some information. Um, we also have independent data um, from glacial rebound. So this is a, a picture of Hudson Bay, shoreline of Hudson Bay in northern Canada. And up until about 10,000 years ago, this was covered with a thick sheet of ice, uh, kilometers thick. So that ice pushed the crust down into the mantle, the weight of it. And then on geological time scales, it melted away essentially instantly, just uh, was gone. So now that load has, has gone away. And it's like if you had a block of wood in a bathtub and you know, put a load on top of it to push it down, you take that load away, say take your hand away, it'll pop back up and it'll pop back up pretty quickly because water's not very viscous, but the water has to flow in behind it. The same thing has to happen here. The rate that it's uplifting depends on how fast the mantle below can move in to take up that space as it's going up. And this is still happening now. We can actually measure with GPS how fast in various locations uh, the crust is warping up. And we also have information from uh, these fossil beaches, those dark, each one of those dark streaks you see there is a former beach line. So they're now uplifted above the current uh, beach level and those can be dated. So based on those, we have a sequence of ages and a sequence of heights above current sea level that uh, tells us how fast the land is uplifting and those agree well with the GPS measurements. So that gives information on uh, viscosity of the mantle and there are various other things that are used too. So the problem we have is we want not just the observational constraints because we want to be able to apply you know, this to other planets too. Uh, we want to measure um, viscosity. And as I said before, this is a really hard thing to do because this stuff is really, really viscous. Um, so you can't really um, directly measure the viscosity of, of a material. People are working on you know, developing techniques for doing that. Um, but what we have to do is look at uh, something a little bit more fundamental and then from that extract the viscosity. And it turns out, that the, and this goes back to Einstein and his experiments with uh, Brownian motion, his you know, thought experiments mostly with, with Brownian motion um, that he published in 1905, viscosity is related to the hopping of atoms through a material. So Einstein's work was with liquids, but it turns out very similar things happen in solids too. And the Stokes-Einstein equation that, that came out of uh, Einstein's work on Brownian motion is written here for a liquid. The important things to know are the D, the diffusion coefficient, how fast atoms hop around through a material is inversely related to the viscosity. So the faster things hop around, the lower viscosity, the less resistant to flow they are. And you can use this relationship for liquid or similar ones for solids um, in order to determine the viscosity if you know how fast atoms diffuse. Now, Diffusion of atoms through crystalline materials is also really slow. Um, that's why the viscosities are, are so large. But uh, unlike the viscosity, you can actually measure those. Um, and you can do um, simulations, uh, molecular simulations uh, on that too. 
So this is our, our picture of seismic velocities in the Earth again, and I'm showing this because there's another important transition that happens here, the 670 kilometer transition uh, that we now know is uh, due to a transition to bridgmanite, those olivine minerals, ringwoodite, break down to this mineral bridgmanite plus magnesium oxide. Um, and this is one where we didn't know that uh, bridgmanite was stable or that the structural transition happened until long after the, tr the seismic transition had been identified. There's another one that was um, discovered only in 2004, 2005, so only about 10 years ago, uh, known as post-perovskite. There's another transition of bridgmanite to this other structure. And this mineral has very different properties. Uh, again, this is one that, wasn't, that was identified first in molecular simulations in the lab before there was ever any seismic indication or any other geophysical indication that it existed. And the reason for that is you don't see anything like a jump in, in, um, in velocity there, but this is a really complicated, where this transition happens is just above the Coromandel boundary where you have seismic velocities. This is the average, which looks pretty flat. But if you look from one region to another, they vary wildly. Sometimes they get faster, sometimes they get slower with depth. You know, it's a really complicated region. So that probably has something to do with this post-perovskite. It's something that people are really still uh, investigating and trying to figure out. Um, but these are, for most of the Earth's mantle, these are the minerals that we have to worry about because that's the bulk of, of Earth's mantle. So. Um, we did uh, some of the first experiments on um, diffusion in Earth's lower mantle materials, or really any material, under very high pressure. Um, well, this goes back more than a decade ago. But these are some of the first experiments, and we've continued to do this, but uh, I still like to show these first ones. Um, so this is an experiment where we're, we're trying to determine the diffusion rates of all of the atoms in this material. So we've got a, a single crystal of magnesium oxide. And the reason we started with that, even though it's the second most abundant mineral in the lower mantle, is it's way easier to work with. It's, you, you can buy cr big crystals of it, no problem. They're, they're pretty cheap, uh, stable at low pressure. Uh, if you use bridgmanite, you have to try to make a single crystal. You have to do a high pressure experiment. It, it's, it's really hard to do. And then you can't look at the pressure dependence because you can only, in the multi-anvil device, barely get into the region where it's stable. Um, so we started with magnesium oxide, took a single crystal, normal isotopes, and then we uh, made a polycrystalline sample. You can see if you squint your eyes, the individual crystals, individual crystals of MGO, that is enriched with magnesium-25 and oxygen-18, which are minor isotopes of, of uh, stable isotopes of magnesium and oxygen. And then we compressed and heated the sample up. And if you leave it long enough for hours, there is, uh, the atoms are hopping around, and you get mixing of the isotopes. And so these are uh, ion microprobe uh, pits where we analyze the isotopic composition uh, going across. And they're uh, you know, tiny little pits. And this is what we found uh, is you know, a change in the isotopic composition as you go from the isotopically enriched polycrystalline sample uh, to the single crystal. Magnesium diffuses a lot faster than the oxygen. And um, based on this, we can uh, back out what the viscosity is. Um, so with these experiments, we could only go up to 25 gigapascals, but we measured over a range of pressures. Um, people have since done theoretical calculations to, uh, on this that agree very well with the experimental data. And those aren't limited in pressure, so you know, we can ex those can be extended to, to much higher pressures and temperatures. And now, because we now have good agreement between the experimental data and the theoretical calculations, we can extrapolate down to higher pressures. And we can also look at the other materials that are really hard to investigate in the lab, like bridgmanite and post-perovskite. So here is an example of uh, molecular dynamics simulation. Um, 
there are basically a couple of different techniques that I won't go into detail on uh, here, but basically using this, you can see in the simulation, mostly the atoms are just vibrating, but occasionally you have one jump to an adjacent site when that site is open. So if you, you look at this, you'll occasionally see that, and that's the diffusion process. You have just the vibrations, and you have atoms actually exchanging sites. So you can get the diffusion coefficients out this way, and like I said, they agree pretty well. Uh, so uh, people have now, with simulations, looked at diffusion of all of the different uh, species and the materials of Earth's lower mantle, and derived the viscosity based on that, and that's in blue, uh, the Bridgmanite uh, data, uh, which are in pretty good agreement with the observational information that we have on the viscosity structure of Earth's mantle. So that's encouraging. It means we're, we're getting things uh, probably pretty much right. And now we can go to other planets and uh, you know, do these types of simulations to figure out what the viscosity structure is. This kind of thing, though, only works, as I mentioned before, for things that are sort of like Earth and they're made of you know, silicate-type materials. Um, as I mentioned, there are uh, some exoplanets that have very, very different compositions than the Earth. And it's interesting to sort of do science fiction, you know, think about, wow, well, what, what would those planets look like? Not just at their surfaces, which would be vastly different, but their interiors. And uh, so there are, um, hypothetically, and there's some observational information now, uh, that there are planets that have really high ratios of carbon to oxygen. Um, so those would be really, really different. So instead of having oxides and silicates, um, the interior would likely be silicon carbide, titanium carbide, diamond. Those are all really hard, very stiff materials. Diamond has a really high thermal conductivity. They probably don't convect inside because they're so stiff and because they can lose their heat by conduction. Then they, you know, closer to the surface, they would also have graphite, which is a really soft material that has low viscosity. So it's interesting to think about how those would be different. Um, and I'll stop there. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.